the network. What's up, everybody? It's Brandon and Sean, and welcome to Music News That Matters, where on the first of each month, we help you sift through the noise to bring you the most important industry news. We know there's so much information out there, but we're going to focus on topics that are most relevant to you guys, and as always, we'll give you our perspective as well. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about a very hot topic regarding the raging debate between artists and streaming platforms, mainly Spotify, about being paid more in royalties. And before we get started, since these videos are only once a month, make sure you sign up to our newsletter to get notified of the latest news and why it matters in between episodes. You can also listen to this podcast on the go now, along with this episode, along with all the future ones, because we're on Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, and many more. All right. So, Sean, how you doing? <laughs> good. How are you, man? Yeah, I'm all good. Yep. Another, another week in lockdown, another month in lockdown. It's been a while since we've spoken about it, but another busy, busy month in the industry. Yeah, a busy slash not so busy because of COVID type type deal what are we just before we even get off of covid how long are we in is this two months now it's got to be at least two months right isn't it i think yeah it feels yeah, like the beginning of march now we're near the end of end of may now yeah hey but, well you know best best of wishes to you i know that that lockdown lock-in is, is tough on you same for you as well. And I, same for all you guys listening and watching as well, because it's a it's been a very tough time, not just for everyone in general, obviously for artists as well. And you guys watching, it's been pretty tricky. And one of the big debates this month, it's been sort of going on mainly in the UK, probably elsewhere as well, is about Spotify and other DSPs needing to do more to support artists with regards to, you know, helping them financially because they're not getting any income from touring right now. Obviously, mm -hmm. live streaming has been helping to an extent, but. There's a lot of lost income and also there's been a lot of bad blood between artists and Spotify and Apple Music and things for not getting enough money for years now. And it's really sort of like ramped up this debate of late. There's been a campaign called Broken Records over here using a hashtag to try and campaign to get Spotify to pay more. It all yeah. kicked off at the beginning of the month. Um, there's an artist called Tim Burgess who tweeted Spotify directly. He said, hey, Spotify, I feel like I'm working for you here. I really think we should look at how much you give to artists. We should work together on it. It's just not fair <laughs> at the moment. You have an amazing thing. It just needs to be fairer. So it's all snowballed. There's more, loads of articles in the press about it. The Guardian covered it. Vice have covered it. Music Ally have done some pieces on it. And there's been a lot of new campaigns started since then. But what I thought we'd sort of try and discuss is sort of like explain some of the potential options to give artists more money and why it's not as simple as Spotify should triple their royalty payouts, for example. So I'm going to try and explain to you guys a bit about, the, you know, to give you the lowdown on what, what could be done and what situation is. Yeah, let, give me your words on why it's, the, the, the why it's not as simple as tripling the payment, that part. Because we can really explore all kind of uh, versions of the stakeholders or who should be giving up what. But yeah, just the just the why it's not that simple part. What's your perspective? Yeah, because obviously I've, I've been quite guilty of not really thinking it through myself. So I've been doing a lot of reading and it's been insightful because obviously the first thing to point out is that Spotify doesn't pay you guys as artists or songwriters directly. They pay their money to right. labels and distributors and publishers and collecting mm -hmm. societies, and then they pay you. So let's say, I think right now, Spotify has a royalties pool and they pay about 65% of the revenue to the labels. And also they keep the other 35% to help them run their business. Um, and obviously, this goes to the labels. They then give you some money. And obviously, there's a lot of figures floating around about how much you get per stream. Like, there's, there's a big one, which is like 0.0348. Mm. Now, that this would have been worked out, obviously, you know, after it's all been said and done. So you can turn that into a per, ream, uh, per stream rate by dividing your royalties by your number of streams after the fact. But also that's depending on how much the label actually gives you as an artist. So Spotify can't just triple this from 0 0.00348 to 0 0.01044 because that would mean it would have to triple its um, re uh, percentage from 65% to like 195%. Not physically possible, obviously. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not up to Spotify to triple like the rules rate. They can't physically do that. Mm. So it's something very important to understand from that regard. So who are we blaming? Who are we blaming? 
Well, I guess it's, I guess it all comes into everyone. So there's a few different like options I'm going to go through, but um, first one is an alternative method in terms of the way artists get paid because one very popular system that people have been lobbying for, for a few years is a user centric payout system because right now we operate on a pro rata system. So this means that the biggest artists get most of the money. So for example, if Drake gets 5% of the total streams on Spotify for that month, then his right holders get 5%, which means Drake's music gets 5% of your subscription. So even if you never listened to Drake on Spotify in, in that month, 5% of your money will mm. still go to him. Right. So the big, you know, the big, the big artists always win, but in the user centric model, you own, your money goes to the artist you listen to only. So if you only listen to one artist uh, that whole month somehow, then they'll get 9.99. They'll get all the money of your subscription. Got it. Interesting. I like that. You do, yeah. But how would that fuck shit up? All right. So that means maybe Drake is pulling from a smaller pool, right? Because it might be a small number of people listening to him a lot of times in an in extreme state. All right. So that means that would that could easily like even the playing field in some ways or obviously lessen general generally speaking when you're talking about somebody like drake of course their level of commercial ability they're getting reached uh listened to by a lot of people but does that ever backfire at some point so if i'm your fan base and now the split is between the 1000 people that listen to you all right and so what 1000 times let's just say this month 999 well no we'll just stick with 10 so we'll say a hundred thousand dollars to to split that's the pool as far as the collective amount of money those people paid in but mm -hmm. then you have to split still between those other people that those people listen to right yeah. that's yeah. how that system will work mm -hmm. so you're pulling from a smaller pool potentially at that point and i and i wonder if it will benefit some people but then some people, it'll obviously make their numbers even smaller exactly. just because of, you know, you might have a, a very few power listeners, which that, that could suck. So, I mean, I think that one has to be thought through before you even demand the user centric. It sounds better, but I would want to walk down the, the, the line and really look at the stats on how many artists have an average of how many unique listeners yes i guess monthly listeners is probably that gauge but all right but, but when we look at the full spectrum how many artists are at what level and then now what are you talking about because you need how many artists and, and um have no how many monthly listeners do artists have on average at different levels and then you also need how many different artists an individual user listens to on average those are the two primary numbers in that equation yeah. if i'm getting that correct so i would yeah. be interested to see and hear more of that so i could at least get some averages before saying that would be the go-to i don't think it's a, a great idea in a sense that obviously the romantics will say that it's taking from the rich and giving to the poor you know as in like mm. because it, super fans might you know give them smaller artists more money than you usually get however yeah. we live in a very sort of like lean back listening culture at the moment with, with all this with all these streaming platforms and most of the big players people will put on will have the big artists on so therefore they'll still be listening to those big artists and the other point is that my concern with this system is that it can be very easily exploited you could just stream you could just constantly stream one one artist on your account and they get all the money so you could build like bot accounts and fake accounts and yeah. really drive up revenue so there are there's a yeah. lot of things that we need to be ironed out with this yeah that's interesting. Um, even the, the bot angle. And also, in some ways, the rich deserve it. Because when you have a certain level of commercial success, yeah. there's a certain amount of fans that are on there and a, a certain level of legitimacy to the platform that made it that platform. So the company itself, Spotify, has to favor that in some way. If there is no far better option that gives, you know, that makes everybody happy, you have to really favor the people that are the reason that your platform was able to hit a threshold 
in the first place. Exactly. So. Yeah, but they're not going to change it in, in unless they're absolutely sure because obviously they fund, they keep Spotify alive with labels, and if they feel they're not getting a fair share of the of the royalties now, then they're going to pull the plug, and that's the end of Spotify. So I, obviously yeah, yeah. it sounds really harsh, but you know, at the end of the day, it's a business, and they've got to keep their best interests at heart. And it just needs this system could work, but needs testing. I know that Deezer have been very keen in the past about trying to implement this. They were supposed to be doing a trial run this year, just in France only, mm-hmm. but it hasn't happened yet. But they are very keen on trying this model and seeing. I'm interested to see the results if it does go ahead. But obviously, given what's happened, they're probably going to pull the plug on that for a while. But it's certainly an interesting yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. So I mean. I, I kind of like the idea of really artists just getting a better deal in the first place on the front end when it comes to the relationships with labels, managers, or whatever, because this will lose and this, it'll kind of start to jump ahead, honestly, to, I know one of uh, something else you want to talk about, which is the Joe Rogan deal. Um, yep. But it, it all speaks to one big pocket and one big elephant in the room that we don't address enough. All right, Spotify, in their mission, right, is this huge thing they want to do for artists, like helping so many but have a livable wage and all that stuff, right? Yeah. It's a very pro-artist mission that they have. But the issue is, right, Spotify is a baby being born into a world of sin, right? They come into the music industry and it's already set up against them. You can't help the artist any more than you can g- get rid of the labels or go through the labels. You already have to go through the system that is set up against them. The labels have these artists yeah. locked in and they're the ones doing the licensing. You, don't, you can't control or change the structure of their deals. You can only create a deal and whether it's 100% the best deal or not, still doesn't change the fact that whatever your deal is the the screwing that goes in on the on on the back end of them getting a small portion of that so it's an altruistic mission that is kind of set up to fail or no not kind of it is set up to fail as long as the labels or institutions that people think are screwing them over are the ones that are in control because also because of that control that they're they're given and gifted because of the catalog they have. They have a disproportionate influence on Spotify because that's that's who you have to run through. That's who you have to negotiate with. It might be more art. It's it's it's, it's society, right? Yes, there's far more people on the bottom, but the people with the influence and where most of the weight is held is at the top. And unfortunately, for artists in general, it creates a situation whether or not platform. Uh, Spotify truly wants to, right? It's or not, it's almost unachievable, which is Mm -hmm. why Spotify as a company, when we look at like the deals like Joe Rogan and we start talking about the podcasting direction, I'm a firm believer that and to some extent, Spotify has done just like, like so people, so many people in the music industry, right? You, how do these, how does Jay-Z make his money? How does insert big artists make his money? Most of these people make their money outside of music, right? Especially not directly the sale of the music. Most of these people say, oh, I need to go somewhere else to get rich. And I yeah. think Spotify is saying, shit, it is hard to make money in the music industry, just like so many other people. Mm-hmm. And say, how can we go make some money? And, and, and that's what it comes down to. Exactly. So you've touched upon like two points there in terms of two of the other options I was going to refer to. So obviously the first option we said was the user-centric payout model. Now, mm-hmm. another option would be for musicians to get a bigger share of streaming royalties from their own labels and management company. Well, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but basically that would be a sense that, you know, the contracts need to be negotiated, need to be a bit fairer at the start when they're signing new deals. But the other All point right. you touched upon is that should Spotify pay a higher percentage of its revenues out? So I said at the start, they only pay... 65% and obviously they keep the 35% back to you know, keep the business afloat and keep it going and growing. Whereas you've got sites like Bandcamp that pay 90% of the, of the money out. So should Spotify increase this to more like 70 or 80% or higher? And this you is what we get at 60? 65%. 65? Yeah. This is when we get into the debate about where people get angry 
when they invest a hundred million dollars into the Joe Rogan podcast deal, because obviously they're keeping back the money to make these deals. So, but yeah. obviously that's obviously in their best interest though, to, you know, to grow and, and expand. So it's, so on one side should they increase revenue on the other side, they've got to run their business. And think about it. That's also showing you the value of your content. It does that so much so for creators in terms of podcasting, but it even gives you an idea, even with the music, the value of your content. No, there's no single artist that has been paid a hundred million dollar deal. I get it. But if you look at it, 60%, right? Or 65%. If someone says, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll give you 65% of the deal. That doesn't sound that bad, right? It's not that violating. Yeah. Yeah. But when it gets cut through all these other pieces, then you end up with what you end up with. All right. So exactly. Like, so, you know, in some senses, I'm sure the licensing deal that these labels have are a little Joe Rogan-ish, right? We just never think about what are the labels getting in, in, in mass and, and as a whole, because Joe Rogan's deal is a, is a, to some extent, not fully, right? But it, it's, a, it's a licensing deal. I'll say that. It is a licensing deal. I was gonna say yeah. music licensing deal, but, but, but because it's a licensing deal, it does have some similarities. And so when you consider that part, all right, what does it really look like? Okay, you're, you're popping like this and you, I think it's three years, right? A hundred million for the licensing and you still own it. That's the biggest difference between Joe Rogan, right? And the artist, <laughs> right? Yeah, He still yeah. owns it. He, so he can have control of it, license it. And then at the end of the day, if he wants to, to pop and, and keep moving, he can, he can do that. But just the fact that he's the one in control of the creative to a fuller extent changes the game versus an artist who signed to this whole system where really the system is speaking for you. And then the other situation is an artist who might own all their stuff, but the, the leaders of your industry as a whole are still running through that same middleman, which is the labels. It, it's meaningful yep. when the leader Right, because the leader sets the tone. And Joe Rogan, if Joe Rogan was signed to some other type of entity and, and, and kind of ran through a, a record label ish type system himself, then that also would have diluted and set a lower bar for how the other content creators. But since he wasn't on that, now you you get to see a fuller vision and version of what that's worth. Exactly. This kind of this is why I want to talk about this topic really because. The obviously the debate is sort of feels like is the people versus Spotify, but I'm not trying to defend Spotify here, but I'm trying to be like objective. But it's not all their fault. Everyone's got you know everyone's got a part to play, and and they're not in they're not in control. They're not the gatekeepers. The labels keep Spotify afloat. They're not in control in this situation. Therefore, it's not just them who should be getting attacked. And that's what we're trying to do in this sort of discussion right now is try and highlight that. And it's the same when you talk about the Joe Rogan deal. We know he's in control. Spotify are in his hands. He can pull. He can pull out when he likes. They've got no control over what he talks about. They're obviously here to facilitate him moving to the next level in terms of audience reach, which is why the labels are on Spotify yeah. because they know they can get a lot of value from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and which is why Spotify is like f this music stuff. I want to go into this podcasting thing because Joe Rogan setting the tone and he's legitimizing the platform even more so for podcasts, but everybody's deal doesn't look like his. And I'm not talking about payout. I'm talking about ownership. They, they bought the ringer, I believe as a whole, uh, which is, I don't know if you know that podcast, but uh, this do Bill Spence Simmons, very credible and, and, and dope podcast. And they're buying a lot of this other stuff outright yeah. where they're, they're, they're owning. So it's cool. Okay. Yeah. We, we, the worth of that, like the trickle down effect of even just licensing and having that exclusively, even if we don't own it, to trickle down to this other stuff that we actually own, it is, it, it's, it's, you know, $5 billion worth, right? How much the stock went up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Like that's, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing for them as a company. And that puts them in a position where now you don't have this variable cost of whatever the licensing and what am I paying this month? You have a fixed cost because I own it and whatever costs to run this shit and any profit on top of that, whatever that looks like, which I'm more interested in digging more into what that is. Do they, is it just the sponsorships that they're taking from or, or what, but whatever the, the profit is, you know, margins only grow, right. With the cost being fixed. Yeah. 
Dull. And obviously, the, the funny thing is as well that a couple of years ago, Joe Rogan was asked about why is the podcast not on Spotify? And he's like, you know, at the time he was like, we don't need to be, like, I don't care about Spotify. And now here we are and he's signed a deal. It just shows you how, the, you know, the money talks and the business side of things. Like it wasn't in his oh. best interest back then to be on Spotify. He didn't need to be. But now he's got the capital behind him where he's like, okay, I'll, I'll consider you now as an option. He was on Apple before? I, I, I think he was, I think he was an independent. Obviously, he had a good relationship with Apple. He was one of the top podcasts oh, on Apple. But he, but he was just man. asked a couple of years ago, why are you not on there? And he was like, it's not relevant for us right now. I didn't, re- I didn't realize that he wasn't on it. Um, especially even like if he wasn't seriously on Apple, because that's even more so about your worth, right? Mm-hmm. If he was on Spotify already, he wouldn't have been able to get the deal that he got. Exactly, particularly yeah. particularly yeah. not to that extent one you're already on there so you know um so you know I mean, we don't have to convince you to come over we don't necessarily have to talk exclusive mm-hmm. two we also are going to be valuing you less on the brand appreciation and that uh what's the word good it's good something what is based on brand i can't remember what it's called goodwill i believe the goodwill of your brand, it's just based on the numbers because we already see what your numbers do on our platform, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe there's that additional aspect of, okay, taking people from other platforms if we make it exclusive, but that that changes the negotiation completely. So the fact that he wasn't on there and in a sense held out, whether it was all strategic or not, there was a huge benefit to that deal and how it happened. I know people who are like that with TikTok because TikTok was trying to get people to come over, right? Just like so many of these platforms do these days. Yeah. And yeah. like, ah, nah, I don't want to get on yet because I want to go through their system versus just being on there and then they see how I operate. Let me get money to get onto the platform. So yeah, that's, uh, wow. I, d- I did not realize or think about the fact that he wasn't on, um, on Spotify, but that part should be noted for anybody who probably think, let me go start a Spotify podcast and then get bought up by, by Spotify. Right. Or like, I think it's a little different. It's a little different. Because a lot of his viewership is actually on YouTube. That's where a lot of the views came from because the video formats on there. So he was still, when, he YouTube. was still, yeah, exactly. So he, that was his, he's in control of that. He obviously, he was on Apple, Apple podcast. He was the number one downloaded podcast last year above New York times daily. But he wasn't actually with Apple like exclusively, mm-hmm. so it just it. it just shows you that. And now, and obviously, he, at the time, he didn't care about Spotify because he was doing well on his own. But now he's seen the potential. He's like, okay, I'm getting a lot of money here. I mean, he can take us even further now, in terms of like our reach. Yeah, and you obviously see him a long, he's a long term strategy behind it now. But at the time, it wasn't really relevant to him. So, and still owns it, man. Yeah, I'm sure. There's bonus incentives attached to things and. Like all type of performance and back end things that the deal, I would not be surprised if the deal was at least 200 million plus after all money is, is allocated. But I don't, you know, I don't know. It should certainly shake up the industry now in the, in the podcasting because obviously it's having, it's like, it feels like a very big like watershed moment for like, you know, new big deals being signed. Yeah. I'm, the, Cause we already saw the trend start where podcasts just started to pop up more and more out of nowhere. Anyway, it became mm-hmm. a popping thing again. So, I mean, you add on the fact that there's money in the game. People are thinking complete. Everybody who has a podcast are like, Holy shit. Like they weren't, they weren't even thinking about that kind of thing. It just automatically just ch- change your perspective. I, I guarantee there's nobody who has a podcast, especially anybody who has a, a consistent audience, no matter what level that is. They're now like, yo, this is a business opportunity. It's, it's, like, mm-hmm. it, it, it's the same as, uh, shoot, anything that starts more, that could be the niche, the love, like even sports, right? It was it, the culture in sports when people were making $30,000 a year or, or barely making more than anybody versus now you're making hundreds of millions. Right. And now yeah. it, it, it goes from I have my, my godfather was like uh, he could have went to the league or he um, but his mom was sick. So he rather just get a job closer to home. Right. So he can take care of his mom. You, tr- yeah. you 
you try to take that till today, I need to go to the league so I can take care of my mom. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's, it's a different level of money and people are farming their kids to go to go to the league. And now I think people will be farming, maybe not necessarily training their kids for a podcast. Although <laughs> there are people doing that with their kids in, um, in, in terms of influencers. And take so, yeah. Yeah, there'll be people a lot more strategically like saying, oh, no, we're not just having fun conversations. It's, uh, we can get some money. We might not get 100 mil, but we can get a mil. We can get 400,000. There's, It's going to be interesting. Um, and I think content as a whole, though, people, I don't think artists felt it as much as they should, but that as was a big win for content as a whole for anybody who notices and pays attention to the fact that that showed a sense of value, all right? Like Drake should be looking at that, all right? Uh, like everybody should be looking at that and start realizing, oh shit, my content is just like Beyonce was uh, with the uh, Coachella and she yep. sold that to yep. Netflix. Like all those things are like, okay, hold up. No, this content is worth some money. Like, oh, I can't just perform just because I just perform at Coachella and take the the performance fee, I can get less on the front end, just like anything else, and then resell this on the back end for fifty million dollars more than they would have paid me just to perform. And it's something I'm already yeah. doing. Wait, what? You know that the the content, the way we think about content, has to change, um, and it's not just a podcast thing. Echoing what you've just said about big artists needing to take notice, there's actually a nice quote from uh, Ted, uh, he's a music writer called Ted Gioa, I think, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, his surname, but um, he said that a musician will need to generate 23 billion streams on Spotify to earn what they're paying Joe Rogan for his podcast rights. So what they're saying is that Spotify values Rogan more than any musician in the history of the world. So there you go. Yep, there it is. There it is. And you know, I mean, that, that's, that's just going through the, re the, the record label system. Are they basing that? Because he's basing that on what artists get paid, right? Well, I imagine in, in the sense, though, that, yeah, I guess so. It would take the equivalent of 23 billion streams. And obviously, no one's hitting that kind of numbers. Like, So I guess it's from that perspective mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. In terms of the popularity. but Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, that all still goes back to one not being in complete ownership and at a point of leverage, right? Like I think with Taylor Swift, even though she's still through the label systems and all that stuff, at least she had a point of leverage in terms of how long it took her to get on Spotify and went about that. Jay-Z did that to a less uh to an extent, but I don't think the impact of him being on Spotify would be the same as, you know, Taylor Swift. Um like they there's there's artists out there to do some similar things, but one, uh, they, two things are working against them. Obviously, there's probably just more artists in general. Uh, yeah. But, but two, that lack of just soul power and ownership to be able to say, look, you're doing a deal with me and I'm going to give you everything. And then it's going to have all these streams. It's going to have all of, all of those things. Like That's lessening the deal. And... Three, last but not least, which can't be ignored, it's about future business opportunity, right? Like the fact that Joe Rogan is legitimizing them as a podcast space, right? And and where they move in the future, that that's about future business versus, well, we already got, we started with this artist thing and, and we did our deals and labels probably got more similar deals than some, and Joe Rogan, if you break some things down, but yep. we're in this business already. The value of our future is far more valuable than <laughs> you people that we already have on there. It sucks to, to hear it that way, but it's like that Joe Rogan isn't worth that to everybody. It's just like Instagram, $1 billion from Facebook, not WhatsApp, $19 billion from Facebook, but that, it's not necessarily worth that to every company. So that's also market timing as well. Taking this down to a really, really, really micro level about independent artists and how you should you know have have these like business mindsets and conduct yourself obviously to get your foot in the door now to get heard by a label and get in conversation you have to have a a big presence already you have to have some you know some social proof you have to have you sending out shows you have to come load all your stats and what you're achieving 
But that when you do, if you do achieve that and get into that room, you need to use that as leverage because you're already yeah. in a position where you can negotiate that. And if you do that from the very start, I mean, obviously the higher you go up, you'll have that reputation, you'll have that mindset, and that's how you, you will grow because you can't, you can't get in the door now on talent alone. So you need to come in with your leverage and then utilize it. Yep, 100%. Drawing back to our sort of wider debate about the the artists versus Spotify and about you know getting ways we can sort of you know increase the royalty payouts. Um, another option which I am pretty like think this could be a good idea. It's not going to revolutionise or anything, but the idea of people needing to pay more for their music subscription. So obviously right now in the West it's very common that we pay you know nine ninety nine a month for Spotify or Apple Music or Deezer or, or um, Amazon Music, um, but I really think that they, you know, they could take steps to increase this. So they could, if someone said to me that, so if Spotify said next month we're increasing our prices by twenty five percent, so it costs you twelve dollars fifty a month for a subscription, I'd be totally okay with that. It wouldn't really, I, I, you, know, you get a lot for your money anyway. And obviously, we've seen companies like Netflix very slowly raise their prices slightly over time. And I don't think there's enough risk being taken from DSPs to like slowly raise these prices. And obviously if, it, if they do that, then obviously that means there's more money going in anyway from subscribers. So there's more money to go out to artists. Right. Right. <clears throat> so what would be your recommendations in terms of price? Well, uh, if they said they'd be like $12.50, would, I'd be fine with. If they were to, you know, they were to increase it by you know, $2.50, then I'd be t totally fine with that because I always think back to when I was younger, I would always just, pay, I'd, you know, I'd buy a, a 9.99 CD for an album of my favorite band. Now I get anything I want on the planet for 9.99 a month. It's just mind blowing because I would be spending so much more than that in the past. Yeah. No, I just, consumers aren't trained to think like that. So it could be an interesting thing to see you go from 9.99 to 12.50. And then maybe another four or five years, it goes, you know, up another dollar and, and do it like that over time. That's what Netflix have done, isn't it? They've gone up a dollar. Like when I first started subscribing for Netflix, I'm pretty sure it was at least a dollar fifty, maybe two dollars cheaper than it is now. Yeah. And that's only yeah. and that's only in the space of like three years. You could do it very subtly. You could increase it by fifty cents, and then just yeah. do that once every year or two. Like I think I think there has to be some sort of someone needs to bite the bullet and try and instigate this going up slowly because also on the flip side of this the um the average revenue per user is going down because obviously they're doing a lot of like promotions like get three months free premium so for the first time in the last quarter on spotify for the first time ever the average revenue per user went below five dollars so really under 50 percent now of your sus subscription yeah because of all these free giveaways and stuff it's because of the free giveaways or yeah. is it because of so it doesn't have any COVID relation? No, no, no. It's, it's just from the whole of Q1 for Spotify. So no, it would only be in the back end of COVID. I mean, the front, I mean it would only be the eight days of COVID, I should say. Hmm. So it's actually, got, it's actually dipped below $5 now for the first time. So below 50%. What exactly are they giving away for free? What do you mean? You said there's all the free giveaways are taken away from revenue. Well, you know, you know how they offer new subscribers deals. Like it used to be like three months for ninety nine cents, but now they now they're oh, offering yeah. literally literally offering you three three months free premium for absolutely for, for, for free. So a lot of new uh, subscribers come in, and they take this free travel, and they obviously they stick to the free tier. And obviously, there's a lot there's a lot more users a lot more users now, but obviously they're not paying into it. Therefore, that's why they, that's why there's been a massive nosedive in this average revenue for years now. It just keeps going down each quarter. Now it's dipped yeah. below five dollars for the first time. Yeah, so. they're on this ab aggressive scale. Mm. Um, well, I guess attempt within that just to continue to dominate market space, uh, but it seems pretty tough to take away your qualifier, right? I n free versus ninety nine cents. Ninety nine cents is a, 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 a lot, but from running plenty of campaigns, I do know. A qualifiedly, you know, not somebody who pays, well, no matter how much that payment is, is more qualified than somebody who comes in for free as being exactly. someone who's likely to, to ever purchase. So, yeah, that's that's tough. I wonder more about that move if, if the company sees it's worth it. Yes, the revenue per user is down, but 
do they, from their perspective, see it worth it for whatever other means that they're, well, whatever end they're trying to get to? On on the flip side of this, on a more positive outlook in terms of, you know, you know, getting more royalties, over time, is going to, artists are going to see more because obviously the business is going to grow. So, for example, 45.5% of all subscribers are actually premium subscribers anyway, which is quite a decent amount, and that seems to be growing all the time. And since 2016, they've gained 229 million subscribers. So that's 229 million more. It's a lot more money. And obviously, you know, in three years' time, it could be another 200 million. So it's a lot more money going in the pot anyway. Therefore, right. artists will benefit and, and get more money over time. So, like, you know, things are still improving. Spotify is still growing. Therefore, the money is still going to be growing as well. Yeah, true. I can see that. I can see that. So that is more of a, a more of a more positive outlook on the situation. The the other option or the other sort of thing that was been floating around, obviously, is that should fan funding play a bigger role in streaming? And obviously, this has been the first sort of the first whole month with the new you know, COVID nineteen relief button, the artist fundraising pick on Spotify. And I've seen that the quote is that fifty thousand artists have used this so far. But I've been reading a few articles mm-hmm. on like artist feedback and stuff, and they're not particularly impressed by the and they're not really using the feature because it's obviously very still very hidden away and it's labeled as COVID-19 relief fund which makes it sound like a charity thing to do with COVID not to do with like raising money for the artists and they feel a bit iffy about actually promoting it and stuff yeah I wonder if that's the problem then because I know an artist well I've been waiting to get her feedback on it and she said it hasn't appeared on her stuff yet maybe she's even confused it's only on mobile as well it's only on the mobile app, not on the desktop. Yeah. And a lot of people are using desktop right now because they're working from home, not commuting. Oh. So it needs, yeah. it needs some work. And obviously, will it stick around after it's all said and done as well? It's another question. Is, yeah. that gonna, is it going to stick around? And if it is, it needs to change to be more of a positive thing like the stickers on TikTok. Or it, it's, it's, not, it's not been, as I said in the last podcast, I don't think it's been implemented very well. It feels... It feels very rushed and it hasn't the wording behind it all seems a bit iffy and there's a debate whereas do I do I promote a charity here or do I promote myself? I don't want to promote myself because I feel guilty, but at the same time I need the money and people are just very very hesitant over it, very weary about it and it's not been a I don't think it's been a roaring success like Spotify might have been hoping for, put it that way. I, to me it sounds like they weren't hoping for it. Just to have it named in that way. It sounds more like a, we do this just to say we did it and maybe, and kind of set it up to- Well, well I mean, in a sense, it's not getting a positive PR because obviously all the PR, if you Google it now, like it's fundraising pick, all you're seeing is articles about artists uh, moaning about it. Oh yeah. So yeah, yeah not so, so yeah, obviously, obviously they were trying to obviously maybe, you know, make it not have an impactful, but at the same time, they are getting a lot of negative press about it, which they won't be happy with. Yeah, yeah. They could have did well by just not doing it at all. Mm. Maybe, maybe. But again, they need to show some sort of response, don't they? Because obviously they're getting always fire under fire right now. Yeah. The I'm whole thing saying, we're talking about. Like, but... hey, people would have talked about they didn't do it or they weren't doing it. And then that lasted, that would have lasted the cycle that it lasted. But they wouldn't have had the, hey, this is about to happen. This isn't, this sucks. Wait, this is trash. And up oh, now, whenever they take away the future, the feature, they you know, then we talk about it again and the fact that it didn't work. But, you know, who knows? Like maybe the the value of the attention from, from it. I don't yeah, I don't know. I can't I can't really figure Spotify out when it comes to that particular that feature. St- staying on this topic, but leaving Spotify behind, um, the badges and um, fan funding is coming to Instagram. Uh, on Instagram Live. So you're going to have to purchase your own badges which you can send to creators to support right. them. Which is obviously a good thing. Obviously, it's been done on TikTok a lot and now it's coming to Instagram for live. So they've, sat, they've actually put out some interesting stats so that there's been a 70% increase in views of live streams between from February to March, which is obviously mm. massive. Obviously, yeah. obviously, COVID's got a massive part to play in that, but 70% is still huge. Um, right. How this is going to work is that badges will appear next to a person's name throughout the live video. So fans who have bought these badges will stand out in the comments. And then um, they also apparently unlock additional features, including placement on a creator's list of badge holders. 
So they'll be able to have some more engagement with the actual creator while supporting them. And they're going to start rolling out the, the, the badges with a small group of creators and businesses over the coming months, mainly, I think, in the US right now. But it's going to roll out to Brazil, UK, Germany, France, Italy, elsewhere as well. But right. they're starting to dabble now in this fan funding, which I think is a very good thing. Yeah, I mean, typically, I would look at something like this as like just trying to keep up and not be able to do it well because your users aren't trained for it. All right, it's, it's, it's not the useful audience on Instagram as much anymore. Um, but I don't think that applies here because one, a lot of TikTokers are still on Instagram exactly. and they have exactly. those audience there. Mm -hmm. And then two, I think there's still enough celebrity incentive when it comes to Instagram that if people do it enough, like people want that attention from those people. So it is all, it has a relation to get more attention from those people and things like that. I can see over time this becoming a part of the platform, like a norm of the platform. Exactly. To see people get donations while you're in lives and stuff. And I see your point about, you know, it's not the same audience to TikTok, for example, but that's why I brought up the fact that it's grown by the live stream viewers by 70%. That's probably a lot of first time mm -hmm. viewers that have experienced this and now becoming more familiar with the live streaming. Yep. So, so therefore they would, they would adopt this because they're very new to it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. The other news on Instagram is that IGTV is now going to have adverts for the first time. So they're yeah. going to start rolling out that, but obviously IGTV has got a long way to go right now. It's uh, never really kicked off as they hoped, um, but they are now going to start running ads for up to 15 seconds. They're going to start testing it in the US and Canada in closed beta over the next. They're going to start running. Oh, okay. Never mind. I get it. Ads on the videos for up to 15 yeah, yeah. seconds. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 But that we'll see how that goes. But obviously IGTV's you know, started out as its own app, moved into Instagram, then tried to improve the own, the individual app. And now I just, I just don't know where it's at now, like in terms of how many people use it. Yeah. Yeah. They go. If they're they're trying to make it work however they do it. And I do know, well, I uh, knew and predicted it that, yeah, IGTV will have ads just because I mean, it was, it's been a year or two. But like for one, when I started having things that I uploaded and I could see the, the content ID system try to block certain things on, on Instagram, mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, they're developing a content ID system Yes. What is that for, right? That that's that's just the predecessor to a system that you know that to be able to support um, ads in that way. All right, and then also Facebook ad, Facebook, you've been able to monetize shows and content on Facebook for a while, and you know those two are the back and forth. IG IG creates a feature and then it gets thrown on the Facebook, and Facebook gets creates a feature or two that gets thrown on the IG. So it was pretty clear to me for a while that that was going to happen. And I don't think now that it has happened based on the climate that it's really exciting people, but like they yeah. might want. Because obviously TikTok came along and obviously that's what's sort of probably stunted its growth in that regard. But um, yeah, the, speaking of new features, Facebook's rolling out a new feature as well. I don't know if you've seen this one called um, Collab, where like three independent videos are playing in sync at the same time with by three different users. So they're using it as a way of like making music together, which is a, quite a little quirky little thing. It's not going to be very massive, but it could be useful and fun to explore for musicians. Um, it's a new way to sort of like mix and match original videos. Um, they're going to roll that out over the to US and Canada for the next couple of months. Um, and also you can, what you can do when you created the collab with your, uh, with your two Facebook friends, you can publish it and others can then take the individual videos and do their own videos on top of that, do their own mixes as well. So just something to keep an eye out on. And if you want to try out new things and try and get some more, enga more engagement, like collaborating with other Facebook musicians could be quite good. You can share, yeah. obviously share your audience pages outreach then as well. So yeah. I'll go into more detail about this in the newsletter about how you can go about signing up and things. Um, but yeah, it's a new feature from Facebook. 
And finally, there's a couple of news items about TikTok. Um, first of all, it made $3 billion in net profit last year, which is mind blowing. Um, it's uh, over three, I should say it's um, 17 billion in revenue last year as well. And then there's 3 billion of that is net profit. Wow. Which is just extraordinary. Yeah. I think so for context, it was the the revenue the year before was seven point four billion, so it went to seventeen billion in the space of a year. Facebook? Is, uh, no, Byte Dance. I mean, I, yeah, I'm not TikTok, like, yeah, yeah. Dance? Yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To go with that, sheesh, that's a huge jump. That talk about you need ten billion, yeah, you need ten billion dollars, yeah. That's hyper growth. What was their net profit when they were at seven billion? Oh, I don't know about that figure on my in my notes. Well, we make it congruent, right? It wasn't even. It might have been. Maybe it might have been just under a billion. Yeah. Maybe not, probably not. Probably maybe even less than that. Yeah. Maybe like Jeez. three quarters of a, of a million. A billion. Yeah. Yeah, and then you factor in the fact that they were probably investing in the future to scale. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's crazy. Exactly. <sighs> From a they've also just, side, they've also I just love it. bought, like, yeah, they've also like bought a new office in Times Square, like, like loads of office blocks today. It's funny, Which man. It's, like that's the, <laughs> you no, know, as much as like things evolve to like more digital and and more work from homes and things like that. And, and less retail. It seems like the end all be all when companies make money, it's like, let's shit on people with a beautiful office space. <laughs> exactly, literally. Like it's gonna be, so at least a, a 10 year lease for 232,000 square feet. Um, <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's about, so it's 105 to $135 per square foot. So it's gonna cost like two to $3 million per month for the space. Man. <laughs> So yeah, you make they make all this profit. We're going to splash out in a nice office in in Times Square. Um, must be nice to work for TikTok. I see their. Um, I always see them advertising. They're going to be talk about you know, the job market being like smaller right now, but they're just they're just advertising an absolute ton of jobs. Their their expansion is absolutely rapid. Yeah, they are, you know? and this makes me think about Live Nation acquired some space not too far from Tony. He mentioned it. Um, and I, I forgot however much money it was and whatever the lease was, but, but then it was like a nice way, nicer office space. And he was thinking that, you know, it might suck. They must've committed to that beforehand, before COVID, but now yeah. you're dealing with COVID as Live Nation. And I actually thought possibly different because Live Nation does know that they're going to still be around. They know Plus that. Potential right? takeover as well from Saudi Arabia. You said what? Potential takeover from Saudi Arabia as well. So. Okay, so there, yeah. there's that. At the end of the day, if we're going to be here and we do have money, they could be investing in the future as well, where, hey, this, could, this is probably a great market for commercial, um, commercial leasing, where yep. the deals are better. There's a lot of uncertainty. You have a, a far better position in terms of negotiation. So... I wouldn't be surprised if we heard more companies like this, or if somebody who really, really knew about it, like if there were a, a, was an influx of these type of companies making these type of deals in this market because of the uncertainty is, because um, it's probably a discount on commercial real estate and offices. Probably, yeah. And the, the last thing we're going to leave on, which I think I know you're pretty excited about, is um, By Dance's streaming app, Rezo. Um, obviously yeah. interlinked with TikTok. Um, so the, the new story about this is that obviously Rez is only available in India right now, but they're actually making the two apps like TikTok and Rezo like cross compatible. So TikTok now gives users one tap access to the streaming app Rezo. So if you see an original song playing on TikTok, you can click the button and it takes you through to Rezo directly. And there's also a back button that takes you back to TikTok. So trying to make integrate these two apps and it could really, it could prove to be a massive success for Rezo if all goes to plan. Yeah. I mean, 
I said this, you know, that's all I could say. You know, <laughs> you know that it was written of the world doesn't, which just makes me want to drop that article even more. Uh, yeah. But it, it's just, it only makes sense in terms of user behavior. I have, you mm-hmm. know, some homies and people at the agency that, they, that say that they think TikTok itself will be a streaming app. And that just doesn't make sense in terms of if you really understand tech in- infrastructure and user experience and the need for user experience like if they became a streaming app they would literally be sacrificing the thing that makes them who they are like yeah, you gotta focus on one thing yeah. yeah and it leaves them too much in music now like tiktok is bigger than music yes that is their primary driver but it's still bigger than music right in terms yes. of the app so, so you have to be still you built for that so you, you can continue to scale that side but then capitalize off the music so it makes far more sense to have a a handoff, the, mm-hmm. a clean handoff versus becoming um, both of those things, that, you know, but, but yeah, that focus, that focus is, is huge in business discipline. And I'm just curious to see what Rezo really looks and feels like in English. I don't even want to try to <laughs> play yeah, when, around when, when it actually launches, when it launches yeah. that side. Yeah. 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 If, if they can include just a few bits of what make TikTok so popular, then they can really really, you know, build a hit with the app. Like if they can just integrate in some, you know, some of the videos that play while the music's playing and having these user comments that, you know, float around as well. Like if they can just make it a lot more inclusive and social, then they really might have the actual first true social media music streaming platform. Yep. We haven't seen yet. So Yep. watch this space. And that is pretty much a wrap for what I wanted to cover today. We've really deep dived into the whole, the people versus Spotify debate. And I hope I've brought some more context to, you know, take the load a bit off Spotify and, you know, sort of shift it a bit more towards the labels, but they're all equal in this. Like, you know, I'm not saying that Spotify, Spotify should be doing more, but I'm not, I'm not going to attack them in this. So I'm also not going to defend them, but it's just, there's yeah. a lot more to it than just saying Spotify to triple their royalty rates because that is just not feasible. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you've said it. I don't have anything to add, man. Uh, that's yet another episode of Music News That Matters. 100%. Yeah, let us know what your th- thoughts are in the comments, as always. And uh, keep sharing the podcast and liking it. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Peace. Ciao. It's the network.